Hi friends, did you know there is more Lost Terminal available? Head on over to patreon.com forward slash lost terminal pod and join our membership community. There are 11 bonus episodes available right now, as well as behind the scenes updates, free shirts, VIP discord access, and even two extra seasons of Lost Terminal. We are 100% funded by our members and will never run ads. That would be lovely of you. Hello world. No one has the answers. Amelie and Camille were so generous with their time last night, telling me their advice for life, explaining their experiences. Camille said life was hard. Amelie said life was easy. The debate went on quite late into the night, but when my friends had concluded and retired to sleep, I found myself no further along in my investigation, and with more questions than when I started. Could it be that no one knows how to be human? That can't be. How am I supposed to learn if that is the case? This is quite the setback. My mother could have taught me, I'm sure. She was extremely wise. Though, I must acknowledge that she did not know everything either. No one does, it seems. We were still several days' travel from the location where Camille said they picked up the digital whale song. We are travelling the wide North Pacific on our way to the Bering Sea that separates Russia from Alaska. Camille described the location as being near the Alaskan coast, but still in very deep waters. I wonder what we will find. I admit, though the thought of the ocean terrifies me, I am very curious. There is more information in my databanks recovered from Station 6 about outer space than there is about the deep ocean. Humans live on a thin crust of the Earth, not venturing up or down very much. Space is easy, comparatively, if we're just talking about building a vehicle. A space-faring vehicle need only operate between one atmosphere of pressure on Earth and zero atmospheres of pressure in orbit. But a submarine is a very different proposition. There is an extra atmosphere of pressure approximately every 10 meters. More and more water above you pushing down until eventually, at submarine depths, it's like each square millimetre of hull has tons of weight pushing, squeezing, trying to get in. No thank you. Others must know. I expect it is a simple matter to be human. Living in a brain, surrounded by experienced elders who spent their whole lives also living in their brains, must count for something, right? The collective sum of human experience of millennia has got us so much space travel, medicines, even Wi-Fi. I will unlock my own mind, as others must have done. As work started again in the early light of the spring morning, Camille sat, immobile, on the floor of the bridge. He had been here for a while. I did not like to disturb him. He was surrounded by a rainbow of his tools screwdrivers, a soldering iron and its little wood-burning base, and masses of wires. Good morning, Camille, I said. He did not reply. I focused closer on him. He was awake. I had not accidentally caught him napping. He was slowly fidgeting with the bunch of wires. Camille? I repeated, gently. I'm just not feeling like it today, Seth, he replied, finally. I don't have the energy, you know. I told him that I know all too well the fickle precipice of oblivion we all stand upon for want of our requirements of energy. No, not like that. Wow, are you all right? He replied. I'm fine, I lied. What's the problem? I asked. There's too much work, Camille explained. He couldn't keep all of it in his head. It's like Zeno's paradox, he told me. To repair the hydrophones, you first must repair the control console. But to repair that, you must first restore signaling from the engine room to the bridge and to do that, you must repair the diagnostic mode of the sonar display. And so on, and so on. It is so daunting, Camille explained. I can't think about the scale of the problem, let alone figure out what to do. Perhaps I can help, I said. Let's figure it out together. He and I talked through the issues. There certainly was a lot of work to do. There always is on board ship. Nothing remains stationary. The foundation of the ocean threatens to mill everything we work for into dust. 
but such is life, we must keep going through effort. Camille's problem, we eventually realised after cataloguing all of his jobs, duties and tasks, is not that there is a lot to do, it's that he has started everything. A little soldering here, then down to the engine room to work on power systems, then up to the large flat back deck to the hydrophone inspection hatch to work on them. Everything is started, nothing is finished. I need help, Seth, Camille said, his mountain of unfinished work around him. Can you help me? Our friends have returned. At first I thought there was an island on the horizon, with large trees jutting out of the sand, but after resolving closer, it was the arms of the giant octopus again, waving in the air. They were directly in front of the ship. The creatures must be faster than us, as I did not see them surface. It took 32 minutes to arrive at the location of this wobbly island. I slowed the ship and cut the engines again. This time they were much more playful. Their bodies bumped the ship as Yeshi, Amelie and I watched from the bridge. Where is Camille? Yeshi asked. He's missing this once in a lifetime sight. I checked the cameras for him. He was working on the hydrophones off the back of the ship. I told the rest of the crew where he was. He wasn't missing out on this interaction. If anything, he was getting a front row seat. Camille, should you come inside? I asked, my voice crackling out of the metal intercom at the back of the ship, close to the small crane assembly. I'm nearly done. If I don't do it now, I'll never finish it, he said, pointing to a metal cylinder attached to a long cable. One of his hydrophones. What are they doing to my ship? Yes, she said, pointing down at the front, where a large tentacle was curled around the anchor winding assembly. As we looked to where Yeshi pointed, there was a terrible sound of twisted metal, and then several things happened at once. A large cephalopod arm slammed into the side of the bridge, knocking loose tools and items off the console onto the floor. There was a loud bang and a crack appeared in the large glass window at the front. Amelie shouted and pointed out of the back window, where we could see Camille knocked off his feet. Toolkit slid into the ocean. We are leaving, said Yeshi, grabbing a metal bar and pushing open the exterior door to the bridge. The captain's momentum was arrested by a large tentacle arm working its way through and feeling around the doorway, picking up a spanner. Close the door please, Yeshi, I said, panicking. Yeshi wrestled with the arm and shoved it outside, sealing the door with a rotary handle. We have to help him, Amelie screamed, hitting the rear window ineffectually with her fists. Camille was struggling to stay on his feet. The ship was listing at nearly 16 degrees, and there were many octopuses with many arms all around him. The creatures were not attacking Camille directly, but they were damaging the ship. The rear crane had been torn off its mounting and was lost to the ocean, as were some of the metal containers that were loose on the rear flat deck of the ship. This wasn't any less dangerous for Camille, as octopus arms are semi-autonomous, so if they touch something that feels interesting, they wrap around it automatically. Camille's boots were very interesting and he was pulled off his feet and close to the water. My UHF radios pulsed the signal and a black and orange blur crashed into the mass of arms wrapped around Camille. Evade, outlast, survive, Maddie said, and attacked the octopuses.
We have been sailing away at top speed. The attack was short, but it's left the crew shaken and the ship damaged. Maddie's precise attack on the arm that was attacking Camel was extremely effective. Indeed, we have the remains of the tip of the octopus's arm left on the back deck. Camille was able to wriggle free, and the pair escaped through a bulkhead door into the engine room, sealing it behind them. I reconnected the engine, and signalled it to provide full power, which was not enough. The octopuses were easily able to keep up with our 20 km an hour maximum speed. Amelie warned that the engine is not able to sustain this cadence for very long. She wasn't sure when it would catastrophically fail, but failure was assured. But for some reason the octopuses fell back. They did not dive, but stopped chasing us. Maddie, perched on the roof of the bridge, I wish she would be more careful, used one of her high-power zoom lenses to see closer and relayed the video to me. The octopuses were crowded around one of them, the one Maddie injured. There was a dark colouring in the water around it. The others were touching this injured one with their arms gently. I felt regretful about this. I wish there had been another way. Forget them, what about me? said Camille, holding up his arms covered in scratches and cuts. Hold still, brave boy, Dr. Linda said, while cleaning Camille's wounds. Yes, I'm disinclined to be sympathetic also, said Yeshi. Look at what they've done to my ship. They were trying to sink us. The crew and I talked about what we would do if they returned, or if there were any more sea monsters lurking around. We talked about making weapons to fend off invaders, and perhaps training for such an event again. I could sound a special kind of alarm, so we would know to be ready, I suggested. The conversation halted when Amelie began crying. I don't want to hurt anything, she said, and left the room. The self-defense discussion would wait for another day. The Molly Hughes II continued north towards the Bering Sea. Repairs were happening all over the ship. Camille despairing that he now had ten times more jobs to do. Amelie testing the engine after the full power burn today. Linda cleaning the partially damaged rooftop garden, and Yeshi recalibrating the CWAP system, knocked out of alignment by our attackers. All the while, the sound from Camille's one working hydrophone was getting louder. The whales are still singing. End transmission. Lost Terminal is written and produced by Namtau. Credits narrated by Lucy Stringer. Thank you so much to our Patreon producers, Ada Phillips, Will Taylor, Kit, Dear Yeen, Andrew Krieg, Toby, Jade Felicity Bilkey, and to all our patrons. Follow us on Mastodon at lostterminal at fosterdon.org. Subscribe to the podcast on Spotify, iTunes, or your favourite network. For bonus content and other perks, support us at patreon.com forward slash lostterminalpod. That would be lovely of you. Lost Terminal will return next week.